So the Buddha once said, suffering usually results in one of two things, or both. One is bewilderment, and the other is a search outside for someone who might know a way to get rid of the suffering. The thing about this is how things start from our childhood. We're hungry and we look to the mother. We have this problem, that problem, we look to our parents, we look to our siblings, our friends. Anybody who might some have some idea of how to overcome whatever suffering or stress is bothering us. And because that search for some outside advice is accompanied by bewilderment, we often look in the wrong places, take the wrong advice, which of course just leads to more and more suffering. Now the solution to this, the, the Buddha says not to, not to listen to anybody's advice. That's not what he was advising at all. Even that famous passage from the Galama Sutta that everybody seems to think means go by your own sense of right and wrong. That's not what it says. It says don't go by scriptures, don't go by reports. This doesn't mean to reject them, it means that you simply can't take them as your authority. But he also says, don't go by your own sense of reason. seems reasonable, because that's not always right either. He says, when you see for yourself that a certain pattern of action leads to suffering to yourself, for yourself or for others, and that it's also criticized by the wise, okay, then you drop it. As for something which doesn't lead to self suffering for yourself or other people, a path of action that's praised by the wise, you follow it. So it's a combination of seeing for yourself in your own actions and also developing a good sense of who's wise and who's not. In other words, learning to look for the right people to listen to. And when you meet the right person, like the Buddha, where does he point? He points right back to your own experience. It's four noble truths. What are they talking about? if they're not talking about things that you already have inside you. You already have suffering and stress, you already have craving. And to some extent you have the elements of the path to the end of suffering and stress. So we need these Four Noble Truths to remind us of where we really ought to look. And they include pointers what you're supposed to do with each of these truths. Suffering is supposed to something you should try to comprehend, which is not our immediate reaction. Our immediate reaction is to run away, or try to run away, in the midst of all our bewilderment and search. But the Buddha says try to comprehend it, which means that you have to learn how to sit down and look at it. Not to look at it. requires some strength of mind, and the strength of mind needs help. That's what the path is all about. It develops the factors in the mind that can help you, so you can really comprehend the suffering and stress. Things like mindfulness, alertness, skillful intentions, skillful understanding. We have. We have these qualities to some extent, simply question that they're not developed. We have to work on them. And that's the important thing. Who does the work? We have to do our own work. And that right there is a lesson that many of us don't like to hear. We like the idea that we can be the authorities on what's ultimately right and wrong, what ultimately works and doesn't work. But when we're working and not working, we don't like to be told. That we have to work more, or that we have to be the ones who are responsible. We're always looking for somebody outside to be responsible. Something's wrong with the teacher. I've got to find another teacher. 
can't practice in America, I've got to go someplace else. Don't like this, don't like that. It's those likes and dislikes that get in our way. We use them to justify our not really looking at ourselves and seeing where we're still lacking. Sometimes the ideas that we hold to most strongly are the ones where we're most stupid. It's the word of John so I used to like to use a lot in his translation for Awicha, which is ordinarily translated as ignorance. He said, that's stupidity. We hold on to ideas even though they've proven themselves again and again and again that they don't work. It's like that famous story about Nasruddin eating a whole bushel, bushel full of peppers and crying. Someone asked him, why are you eating the peppers? And he says, because I'm looking for the sweet one. For a lot of us, that's our attitude. We keep trying the same old things over and over again. We keep looking outside for this, looking outside for that help. And the Buddha offers help, but it's help saying, hey, turn around and do the work yourself. We're not sitting here waiting for some vision to come or for some bodhisattva to come down tell us what to do. We have to figure out what to do on our own. Again, the Buddha gives help and gives pointers. But figuring out exactly when to use which Dharma teaching, that's something we have to learn how to observe ourselves. So the principles are all laid out. You see any habits that you have that are causing stress and suffering, you work to let go of them. Or any mental states that you know will cause stress and suffering if they arise, you work not to give rise to them, to prevent them from happening. As for skillful states that lead to clarity of knowledge, if they're not there in your mind or if they're weak, you try to give rise to them. If they're there already, you try to strengthen them. and try to develop a sense of desire, persistence, intentness in doing this. People outside can give pep talks, they can give pointers, but you're the one who has to actually do the work. And so you have to be observant. This is one of the most important principles in the Buddha's teaching. You have to be willing to learn. Learn how to learn. Most of us are pretty poor at that. In school, we were handed all sorts of information, and if we didn't understand it, it seemed it was the teacher's fault. It seems to be the attitude a lot of people have. But as a meditator, you have to develop the, the willingness and the desire to learn new things. Try things out. Look at what works. Look at what doesn't work. When things don't work, don't let yourself get depressed or down. When things work well, don't let yourself get too careless. You've got to have an even mind about these things. As you experiment. Otherwise you want your meditation to gratify your sense of ego. And then when it doesn't, you don't like it. In any case, it's the gratification of the ego that becomes uh, the important issue and not the actual learning of something new. How does this work? How can you get yourself to sit for longer periods of time? How can you deal with this particular defilement in the mind? That's what you want to learn. And if one approach doesn't work, you don't let yourself get discouraged. You try another one. Learn how to develop your ingenuity in coming up with new approaches. Again, the teachings of the Buddha, the teachings of the forest masters, they, they give all kinds of advice. But they keep reminding you that you're going to have to work out the details yourself. And there's no one magic bullet that's going to solve all your problems. Sometimes a particular approach works in getting the mind to settle down, and the next day it doesn't work anymore. It shows that the mind is in a different state, requires a different approach. 
Same with trying to develop insight. Today one approach will work and to develop insight into a particular kind of suffering, and then tomorrow it won't work at all, which shows that the suffering is a little bit different this time. After all, you look at dependent core rising, it has all kinds of pathways in there where suffering can arise. So there's no way that one, one technique is going to cover them all. And that's not really a problem. What makes it a problem is our desire to have one thing that's going to cure everything, that's going to solve all our problems forever, and we won't have to think again. That's not the attitude of a meditator. A meditator develops the qualities that lead to new learning. And then once you have those qualities, you're happy to use them. It's like having any skill. The more you master the skill, the more you enjoy putting it to use in all kinds of places. Even our hunts, even after they've taken care of the problem of suffering. Are still willing to learn about other things as well in the course of teaching other people how to find the way. Even when the issue of suffering is, is solved, they're not creating any more suffering. They see other people are still suffering. Well, try to figure out ways to help them. That's their attitude. So try to work on the qualities that give rise to new knowledge. Learn how to be more and more self-reliant in this way. And when that happens, then there's not the issue of whether you're in the right place to meditate or not, or whether you're the right teacher or the right situation. You begin to realize those elements weren't the problem at all. The problem was a lack of willingness inside to really sit down and watch and learn. Chip away at your own stupidity. Chip away at the things that you sometimes you believe most strongly and are most strongly attached to. It's got to be this way. That's what the mind says. And sometimes that's precisely the problem. Your unwillingness to look at other alternatives. So even though the Buddha is there willing to give as much help as he can, there's only so much help that anybody can give. We look outside for advice on how to put an end to suffering, hoping we can have somebody else take care of the problem for us. Well, the Buddha just points you back to yourself again. But he gives the tools. Try to comprehend the suffering. When you see the craving and the ignorance that underlie the suffering, try to let go. Develop the qualities of mind, whatever is needed in terms of concentration or insight, so you can really look at suffering long and hard. Look at stress long and hard to see what what's causing it. Look at each instance. And even if you don't find the one thing that's going to get rid of all suffering, the big block, the huge abstraction of suffering. Work on your individual sufferings, the individual instances of stress, the individual desires, the individual cravings. Work on them one by one. Don't be so important that you can't deal with the details. And realize that these things don't come all at once in all their fullness. There'll be an individual desire, an individual instance of stress, where you learn from the individual pieces, the individual instances. And over time, you begin to detect patterns that you wouldn't have seen if you weren't willing to look this carefully. So when there's pain in the body, learn how to sit with it and try to figure out what way you can sit with it so the mind doesn't suffer. This re will require concentration, it will require insight, it will require the right attitude. The attitudes that you've developed through the other elements of the path as well, through being generous, through being virtuous. Generous in learning how to give up certain things. Virtuous in learning how to refrain from certain types of activity. In this case, you learn how to give up certain ways of thinking, refrain from certain ways of thinking. That in and of itself helps an awful lot. Translate those skills into meditative skills. 
and then work on the more refined skills that come from just sitting here with the pain, sitting here with the stress in the mind, and realizing that the pain doesn't have to stress the mind. You're doing something wrong. It's not that the pain is you're doing something wrong that causes the pain, but there's something wrong that's causing the suffering. And try to see that in each instance of suffering in the mind. And after all, you begin to see the larger patterns. And that way, ultimately, as the Buddha says, that we'll, we'll reach a point where you've comprehended the whole thing. The whole problem of suffering. At the same time that you've let go of all the causes of suffering. You've developed the path. And that's the end of the search. But even though that particular search has ended, you've still got the tools that you've used to overcome your own problems. And now you can use them to whatever extent you have energy and time. to help point to other people the way they can start developing their own tools, too. So what it comes down to is always being willing to learn, developing the tools you need to learn. Develop skill in using them, and then learning to enjoy, just keep on using them. That's the attitude that we'll see you through.